Alleluia. He is risen indeed. Have you missed saying hallelujahs? We haven't said them all during Lent. And now tonight we can say hallelujah and ring our bells and say Gloria as much as we want because this is the night that we remember that Christ was raised. I'm going to sing a little bit to you. And after you've heard Pastor Katie and others sing so well tonight, I want you to... Um, Listen to this with a, with a mixture of grace and awe. Okay? <laughs> this is a song that doesn't end. Yes, it goes on and on, my friend. Some people started singing it not knowing what it was. And they'll continue singing it forever just because this is a song that doesn't end. Yes, it goes on and on, my friend. Some people started singing it, not knowing what it was, and they'll continue singing it forever just because. I have to tell you, when Aaron and Elaine, <laughs> in a former life, I was a singer, but no longer. Uh, my deafness didn't end to that. Aaron and Elise, when they were little kids, loved that song. It takes about 20 seconds to sing that song, one repetition of it. And so you can get about three a minute in. And from the time we left our house until the time that we would go to my parents' house for a visit, it was 90 minutes. <laughs> you do the math. And we, would, and we would say to them, stop, sing something else. And they're going, we can't. It's a song that doesn't end. And they would like giggle with delight. And so we heard that song a lot. Well, Jesus' life has been like a song to those that he taught and healed, but especially to his disciples, those people, men and women, who left everything to follow him. But watching him be tried and sentenced to death, sentenced to death on a cross, a humiliating way to die, and a very painful, painful way to die, they must have thought this song is over. It does have an end after all, I'm supposing they thought. And everything that they hoped would go on forever was gone. The body of Jesus was laid in a tomb with a stone, a mammoth stone, blocking the doorway so that nobody could come and take away his body and then spread the rumor that he had been raised from the dead as he said he would. And so it looked like this song was over. But resurrection morning, something or some things very strange had happened and were happening. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary go to see the tomb to pay respect, to weep, perhaps, where Jesus was laid. But there is an earthquake. There is an angel coming from heaven, bright as lightning, rolling away the stone and inviting them to come and see that the song was not over, that Jesus' body was not there. And not only that, but a directive to them, go and tell his disciples that Jesus will meet them in Galilee, and there they can see for themselves. And so as the two women hurry away, it says, with fear and joy, mixture of, of feelings there, Jesus himself meets them, and they bow to worship him, and they take hold of his feet. He has feet that you can hold. This is not a ghost. This is not a spirit. This is their friend Jesus, alive again. This is him. Could it be that the song really wasn't ended? I suppose they thought. Nothing like this had ever happened before. This was not a resuscitation, even like Lazarus, as we recently heard about. He would die again, even though Jesus raised him from the dead. This was different because this was heaven bursting into our world. The start of something different and infinitely better. 
Some people are bothered by the ways that the four gospel accounts vary, you know, the number of women and why they were going and, and so on, and whether Jesus saw them first in Jerusalem or Galilee. I want to tell you a story. I have four older siblings, and they're all very close in age, a lot older than me. And then they really are. <laughs> That's true. I'm not saying that like as an insult. So my parents had four very, you know, children very close together. And then they were surprised by me coming much later. And so my four siblings always said that I was the baby of the family and got special treatment. But let me tell you this. If a lamp or something like that was broken or a window, there were four of them. And they could say, that's not how I remember it. I wasn't in the room. And they were telling different things. And they would get away with a lot. When I got there, it's a broken lamp and one kid. So if you know my, some of you do know my older um, siblings. If you see them, you tell them, broken lamp, one kid. She had it rough. You tell them that. But all of these gospel stories are people trying to remember exactly how it happened. And the beautiful thing about it is if they were trying to fool us that this had happened, they wouldn't have been so foolish as to have things seemingly out of place, but they would have sat together and say, this happened and then this happened, let's all say that. And they did not do that. The differences are there because their personalities and the way they remembered it are different. But the similarities are there too. There's an empty tomb. There is a stone that is rolled away. And there are appearances by Jesus to them. But more than anything else, the most convincing proof is the change that this brought about in the disciples' lives. They were thoroughly convinced and their lives were all about telling others, sharing the story, and actually living out the resurrection story. This never-ending song of what Jesus can do in our lives and world. You might wonder, are these the best people that Jesus could have picked to sing this song? Because they had failed him in many ways, right? Peter has denied him, and Jesus gives him the song of forgiveness and renewal and going forward. He's charged with singing the never-ending song. James and John had slept when Jesus needed them to watch and pray, and they're given the grace to wake up and sing the song, to stay alert. Thomas, well, can one sing when you have doubts? I sure hope so. To which Jesus said to him, I'll give you what you need to be sure of the song. And so on and so on. In each appearance, in each person that Jesus met, they were given what they needed to sing. And we'll continue that song tonight. We'll continue it at the font. We'll continue it at the table. A special word to those who are going to be baptized tonight or receive First Communion or join as a member of the church tonight here, this local body, no matter what your age or your place is, your strengths or your weaknesses, you can beautifully sing and live out the never-ending song of the resurrection. Warren's brother, Alan, became, um, he opened his heart to Christ when he was a little under 11 years old. And he died in a car accident when he was 21. Um, and when he died, lots of people sent us letters that Alan had written them. And I want you, the, you young people that are going to be um, baptized tonight to listen to this. One of those letters was um, a letter to a farmer and Alan started it out by saying, I have done something bad to you. He said, I put rocks in the gas tank of your tractor. And he said, but I was not the person then that I am now. He was not 11 yet. 
He said, I'm a new creature in Christ now, and I live for God now, so I'll make that right to you. I'll come and work for you. And I'm sure the farmer thought, but well, how cute to have, you know, this, this little person that can't drive yet come and work on the farm. He wrote letter after letter after letter, and those letters came back to us when he died. It is something in his life that gave him just this, um, he just exuded joy and faithfulness, and his witness lived so beautifully. So Houghton this year, where he went to school, and he died over 40 years ago, but Houghton this year is having a service in October where they retire his soccer number because his witness in Houghton is still strong. Isn't that something amazing? So when you are baptized tonight, I want you to know that you have a never-ending song, but you have the opportunity from this moment on to live as a new creature in Christ. Because when you go under the waters of baptism, you are dying to what you were, and you are living to what you can become in Christ. The resurrection means nothing, absolutely nothing, if it stops the song of Jesus. But Jesus died this excruciating death for us, and he was even buried for us. The fact that he was buried gives us witness to new life when he comes from that. So his song becomes our song. So as we stand at the font and these precious sisters and brothers receive the sacrament of holy baptism, we'll sing the song of new life. When hope was nowhere to be found, hope came alive in Christ. So we'll sing the song of release from our bondage to sin and death and our freedom to live holy and blessed lives. And as these children come to take their first communion, we'll recall that it requires some strength to sing, and that this holy meal instituted by Jesus is just that nourishment for our souls that we need to sing. And as these two sisters in Christ join COS as members, we'll declare that the resurrection song is best sung in chorus. For it may happen from time to time that the words will just not come and if we commit to sing with you when you feel weak or for you when you cannot sing at all and must or even a whisper, that's what it means to be in community. And likewise, you are called to be the singer sometimes when we feel the weight of the world and the song might seem so far off that we can't quite catch the tune. In all these ways and more, the song continues because that is Easter. That is the Easter story, and that is our joy and hope. It is a song that never ends.